Go. Hello everyone, my name is Michael Brooks, the Vice Chairman of the Sullivan County Legislature. And on behalf of our Chairman, Robert Doherty, and the rest of the Sullivan County Legislature, welcome to another Town Hall. Today, we have our County Manager, Joshua Potosik. We have our County Treasurer, Nancy Buck. And our special guest is our Congressman from the New York State's 19th District, Antonio Delgado. We're going to start today with Representative Delgado. He's got uh, some important information to share with us and some of his comments um, to, uh, from his perspective um, with what's been happening with the COVID-19 pandemic and how it relates to the residents of Sullivan County. Congressman, welcome. Thank you uh, for having me, Michael. It's um, good to be with all of you. Um, I hope uh, you are safe and you are healthy uh, during these very challenging times. Um, at the beginning of this crisis, um, back in early March, I visited uh, with the county, Deputy County Manager John Little, uh, and toured the Sullivan County Emergency Services Training Center uh, in Liberty. Uh, it feels like forever ago now, uh, in terms of when um, I made that visit. Uh, and I know early on the folks across the county have been working hard uh, to prepare you know, our region for this pandemic. Uh, and I want to thank you all for the around the work or clock work you've been doing uh, during these times and provide these transparent Facebook live events to keep the Sullivan community uh, informed. I think it's critically important. And my office has been holding weekly telephone town halls uh, to answer questions. Um, and I've been lucky to have a number of Sullivan County officials uh, as panelists uh, during my telephone town halls, including uh, John Little and Public Health Director uh, Nancy McGraw. And I want to thank them both for uh, joining me and sharing uh, your insights. Uh, I invite everyone here to dial into my telephone town hall this Thursday um, at 4.30. I've also had a chance to really connect with folks in the county through um, a series of interviews you've been doing um, that we post on my official website, delgado.house.gov. Uh, we've talked with individuals who work at Sullivan Bosey's who are delivering food. We've talked with individuals who've converted their distilleries um, uh, into hand sanitizer facilities. Um, we talked to individuals who work in the Sullivan Department of Transportation delivering uh, PPE. Uh, and I can tell you just through these conversations, all of which you can see uh, again on my website, uh, the people of Sullivan County have been really going to bat for each other uh, and just doing tremendous work uh, to be there. Uh, and I commend that wholeheartedly. Um, I want to just run through a little bit of the work that we've done legislatively. Uh, you know, it's been uh, a very uh, busy time, I think, in terms of the work we've been able to accomplish on a bipartisan basis. Um, you know, the biggest piece of legislation uh, is the CARES Act, which passed about a month ago now. Um, and there were some big time provisions in that legislation, uh, bills uh, or programs that provide funding for small businesses and, and family farms. Um, I actually have my own bill that was part of that package called the Small Business Repayment Relief Act. Uh, and this provides $17 billion to ensure that every small business with a qualified SBA loan automatically be relieved of their loan payments, including principal, interest, and fees for the next six months. This includes any future loans you enter it into. So a good opportunity for our SBA or for our small businesses uh, to seek lending uh, that might be waived in terms of the repayments for up to six months, an automatic thing. Uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, I think most of us have all heard of this program by now, uh, a critical uh, program that has allowed a number of small businesses across the country and here in the New York 19 um, to sustain themselves. I think we continue to have to fund the program, maintain it, uh, work out some of the kinks. You know, I think the fact that there are uh, certain companies that are accessing uh, the funds when they shouldn't be is the real problem. We should fix that. Um, we were able in the last package, the 3.5 interim bill, which came after the CARES Act, we were able to set aside $60 billion just for underbanked communities, uh, including rural communities. So at least we know there's a pot of money um, that can go to those communities like ours who are not uh, you know, uh, in possession of resources that allow us to just get to the front of the line immediately. So very important to be able to have those funds set aside for rural uh, communities. I also want to flag the fact that we have the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, uh, 
I had to lead the fight on this one because our farmers were left out of that program uh, for a good while, even though the first CARES Act, we said we want farmers to be eligible for this immediate relief. I led a letter, an 86 person, a bipartisan letter to the SBA, calling on them to make sure that our farmers are eligible. When they didn't react fast enough, we passed the bill that made it clear that our farmers should be eligible. Then the SBA told us, well, they're eligible, but they must not apply because the line is too long. So then I wrote a second letter with 77 of my members, bipartisan, saying that's not good enough. And now uh, we know, uh, based on the last 48 hours, 72 hours or so, uh, our farmers can, in fact, access the economic injury disaster loan. So those are uh, it's a very good development for our farmers. And additionally, our farmers are now going to be able to, at least within at least a week or two, access the, uh, the USDA funding. I secured 9.5 billion of that in the CARES Act. There are two programs that the USDA has rolled out. One is a price loss disaster or direct payment program to cover the loss of prices that our farmers have experienced. The second is a purchase program that will buy dairy, meat, crops, specialty crops, uh, and then deliver those goods to food banks and nonprofit organizations. So these are now underway. We are watching those closely to figure out what our farmers have to do to access these programs continue to stay in touch with my office to learn specifics on those things uh, moving forward. I will also note that I introduced a bill along with Congressman uh, Maloney called the Relief for America's Small Farms Act. Uh, this would provide a one-time debt forgiveness of up to $250,000 for farmers who hold existing loan obligations uh, with the USDA. Uh, so this would be a big development if we can get this through the House. Like I said, it was introduced. Hopefully we can get some votes on it in the coming weeks and provide more relief for our farmers. Uh, lastly, I want to speak about moving forward, uh, what needs to be done. Um, you know, I've been pushing aggressively now for state and local funding. Uh, we know, and I know Sullivan County knows all too well at this point, uh, what the impact this is having um, on our local government in particular. Our local government is really feeling the pinch uh, due to the steps that we had to take, we had to take to protect and save lives. Uh, the budgets um, are decimated in light of the lack of tax revenue, uh, and it is imperative uh, that we at the federal level provide meaningful relief. Uh, and I have introduced a bill, and I'm the only uh, member of the House that has introduced a bipartisan bill with my colleague, Republican Lee Zeldin, uh, that would make sure that all local governments serving populations of any size would get access to these funds. That's so important because in the CARES Act, the state and local funding was only for government units serving populations greater than 500,000 people. So if you live in a rural district like ours, the eighth most rural in the country, we're not going to get those funds. So this bill, I think, will help make sure that we get funding, we get support to make sure that we're helping our teachers, helping our county officials, helping our law enforcement, helping our firefighters, healthcare workers on the ground, all of whom provide essential, meaningful services that we have to continue to sustain moving forward. So that's a big, big piece. Uh, my understanding is that there will be a bill introduced in the coming week or two uh, that will provide meaningful, robust uh, state and local government funding and the expectation and I'm going to keep working for this, is that my model, the bill that I introduced with Lee Zeldin, will be the formula to make sure that these funds get directly to our counties and to our small towns and villages. So that is where we are moving forward. I'm happy to answer questions. I know there's a lot of discussion right now about the testing piece and how we open back up and what needs to get done. Um, just briefly on that, we've got to make sure that our testing capacity continues to grow. Because if we continue to open up our economy, we also make ourselves more vulnerable to another outbreak. And the key there is going to be once that outbreak happens, if it is to happen, we've got to be able to test who has it and then do contact tracing and then contain them. Because if we can't contain who has it, then it is going to spread again. It will be right back where we started eight weeks ago. So we've got to make sure we have a real plan at every level of government to ensure that we can test folks in the event that this thing begins to have another outbreak as it did eight, seven weeks ago now. So with that, I just want to say thanks again for having me. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to connect with all of you, and I do look forward to answering any questions.
Thank you, Congressman, and thank you for what you are doing on behalf of the county uh, residents. We appreciate it. Um, we're going to go now to our county treasurer, and Nancy uh, Buck will share her thoughts and insights uh, and give us a, a, a snapshot, if you will, of where we are financially and fiscally with Sullivan County. Nancy? Good afternoon, and Congressman Delgado, thank you for fighting for the, the counties. We do need the federal help, and when the federal government, they talk the word trillion, the state talks the word billion, local counties, we're talking the word millions and millions and millions, and businesses are talking in the thousands. It doesn't matter how many zeros are at the end, we're all hurting. And we understand that the federal government has their own issues, but we do need to see some at the county level to help us and all the other counties around New York State. Um, I know we're not isolated alone, but here's some factual insights and I'm getting a lot of my information from NYSEC, which is New York State Association of Counties. The county sales, this is not from them. Last week we got our first sales tax for the period of March and beginning of April to show us our, our first snapshot. We're 30% down from where we were last year. Over $800,000 down on this one sales tax. We get another sales tax in this week on Wednesday. Um, I'm, I'm nervous, but that's going to show us where we're going to be going moving forward. That means we have seven more months in this year, and if we continue to keep going down 30% on each one, that could be $7 million. NYSEC put in that the possibility of 4 to $3 million on the low end. I'm thinking, again, we're talking 7 to $10 million just in sales tax. We have other revenue sources that are also going to hurt us. We have the state aid, the governor has said, could be 20%, could be 50%. NYSEC figures, again, New York State Association of Counties for someone that may have just come in. If Sullivan County took a 20% decrease in, sales, in um, state aid, that's $4.7 million of a loss to us. If they did the 50% that's been also put out there, that's 11.7 million on top of what I said about sales tax. These are devastation. I, I don't know where we're going to come out of this. Property tax, we just got from the tax collect for three months of the property tax bill that comes out in January. When they turned over our unpaid taxes, they turned over $23 million of unpaid taxes to us. That's what I, my office, we're going to be trying to collect for the next two years. And let me tell you, I've been to work every day, and the phones ring off the hook because people can't pay their taxes. And they want breaks and, um, you know, the pandemic, and I hear the sad, sad stories on the people that had it, their relatives. We're all in this situation together, and we, we do need federal help. We also have other revenue sources that we're not going to be getting what, what was projected. There was a casino uh, revenue, mortgage tax, room tax, um, the small taxes that different departments collect. You know, we're closed. We're not getting any of those revenues. I have proudly come to the legislators and told them that our Standard & Poor's bond rating was double A. That was so fantastic. There's only two ahead of that. There's double A plus and triple A. We knew we could never see triple A, but I'm not sure we can hold on to our double A right now, and that is so upsetting. And that will also affect our future future borrowing. I, I know, again, we're not the only county. There's a lot of counties in the same situation. But if you start adding all those millions of dollars I 
had said in one year just for 2020, I don't know what, what the legislators are going to do. They're going to have to make some terrible, hard decisions. And there's going to be people in Sullivan County that are not going to be happy. I'm happy I don't have to be the decision maker. Um, I'll be there saying yes, that they need to make decisions. It'll be hard, but we can't sustain all these millions of dollars. And this is only 2020. It's going to lean forward into 2021. It's not a one year, you know, let's get out of this because it'll turn over into our retirement and um, health benefits. And it's, it's not gonna stop for a while. And we, so I thank you for coming on and I'm sorry I'm bombarding you, but I'm begging you from at least the County of Sullivan to get us some federal aid. Congressman, do you, would you like to add anything to that? What, I don't know if you heard it because the, the sound may be, you know, I, I understand it may, the volume may be a little low on your end, but. Yeah, I mean, it was tough to make out uh, every word uh, just because the, 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 it was muffled, but I heard the, uh, I got the gist. I, I understand the, the, the concern. I understand that the numbers aren't adding up. Um, I understand that when you're looking at uh, the, the, the revenue sources um, and what you had projected outward and you're trying to figure out how to close that gap, um, the answers aren't coming um, and you need help. And, and that's why I said in my opening remarks, the, the number one priority for me uh, in this next round of aid uh, is going to be state and local and emphasis on local um, and emphasis on supporting our county our counties, we have 11 counties, but yes, you're absolutely right. Sullivan County has been hit incredibly hard here. Um, and so it is imperative that we make sure that there is direct support that goes to uh, Sullivan County, direct support that goes to all of our counties. And one thing I can tell you is this is a real priority for a lot of my colleagues. Um, and there are a lot of numbers floating around uh, out there right now that are gonna be uh, talked about in the coming days about how much you know, we're going to spend on state and local government funding. Uh, so there's two components. It's how much we're going to spend, and then where is that money going? You know, and I want to make sure that, one, we spend what needs to be spent, and two, that money finds its way directly to our counties and our localities who are on the ground and who are hurting. And I think those two things to me are my focus. My bill that I introduced does that work in terms of getting the funding there, and this is a big priority of mine, absolutely. Uh, and I'm, I'm doing everything I can to help. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to start our, our question segment. And thank you for continuing to send your questions to us. The first, actually the way this is going to break down, it looks like the first four questions that I read are going to go to Nancy McGraw. And the last four will go to our county manager, Josh. And then we're going to finish up with a question to our congressman. So our first question, like we always start out, Nancy, what are the latest figures, confirmed cases, people currently hospitalized, people currently recovered, people who have died, and how many tested? Nancy? Good afternoon. As of today, we have 1,087 confirmed cases. Uh, that is a jump of about 70 from Friday. Keep in mind that the more that we test, the more cases we're going to find, and that is the goal in terms of uh, finding out how much of the population is positive to quickly isolate and then be able to contain um, and quarantine. So of those uh, total, only 319 are currently actively being monitored, which means they're on mandatory isolation. Um, 1,074 are in mandatory quarantine, which means they've been exposed to someone but may or may not have symptoms. Uh, 1,750 have been uh, recovered uh, and are currently off of isolation. So that means that, you know, since the beginning, um, I would say the middle of March, um, between those are who have tested positive and have been exposed and have been monitored, our staff are, um, 
have been working to monitor uh, close to 3,000 cases to date between those who are positive and exposed. Um, we have um, 4,912, according to the state's uh, website, of Sullivan County residents who have been tested. Uh, 15 are currently hospitalized. That is decreasing. Um, seems to be stable and holding. Um, and 26 deaths, which is uh, one more than last week. Thank you, Nancy. The next question for you as well. Are the antibody tests currently being administered in Sullivan County reasonably accurate? How long do results take? How long the antibody results takes really depends on where someone is tested, the lab they're using, and the volume of tests that are going to those labs. And I suspect as the uh, number of antibody tests increases, um, the, the wait time may be a little bit longer, but it really varies anywhere from you know two or three days to a, a week or two, um, depending on where you are in the state. So we really, you know, it really depends. And, individuals getting antibody testing should ask that question when they go to get tested. Um, regarding the accuracy of the antibody tests, I just want to go over something um, to clarify antibody testing from the CDC website. And you can go on cdc.gov and read the most recent research and information regarding both uh, diagnostic COVID-19 testing as well as antibody testing, because there is a significant difference. Um, antibody testing is not diagnostic. Um, antibody tests that are commercially manufactured um, uh, come from a, a variety of different laboratories uh, from the private sector and available through different healthcare providers. And they normally go to commercial laboratories as opposed to the state Health Department's website, or I'm sorry, uh, laboratory, which is Wadsworth. Um, the CDC is currently evaluating the performance of these tests in collaboration with um, the FDA, uh, biomedical research, uh, the National Institute of Health, the Department of Defense, and the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. So we currently don't uh, have a lot of uh, information right now because they're currently ongoing research in terms of the accuracy of the antibody tests um, that are being used uh, widely in the um, population. They're designed to provide results to people um, or healthcare providers to show whether someone was previously infected uh, with COVID-19. However, these tests do have some limitations. Uh, specificity and sensitivity, which means a true positive rate of antibody tests vary depending on the type of test being used. They shouldn't be used to diagnose someone with uh, active uh, infection, and it typically, typically takes one to three weeks after somebody becomes infected with COVID-19 for their body, bodies to make antibodies. Some people might take longer than others to develop antibodies. Um, depending on someone, when someone was infected and the timing of the test, it may or may not find antibodies in someone with an active infection. So you can see the wide um, range of questions and issues that need to be resolved by science before we can really have a lot of confidence in the antibody testing results. However, it is a tool and it is an important tool going forward. Um, so as, as soon as the research uh, starts to roll out in terms of the, the gold standard and the, the most um, accurate tests to be used, um, I'm very hopeful and confident that our healthcare providers uh, will be utilizing that and to make sure that uh, we have the best information available to us. Thank you, Nancy. Our next question is also for you, Nancy. With the governor's mandate to test nursing home staff twice weekly, how many nursing homes are there in Sullivan County? How many tests will this require weekly? And how realistic will this be? There are four nursing homes in Sullivan County. Um, the skilled nursing unit at Kesco Regional Medical Center, Achieve Rehab and Nursing Home, 
Roscoe Rehab and Nursing Home and the uh, Sullivan County Care Center by Sunset Lake. So uh, these four nursing homes combined have about 340 patients. Um, that does go up and down um, depending on you know what's happening. Um, staffing, we're in the process of getting accurate numbers on staffing by nursing home. Um, I would say between three and 400 staff uh, are probably employed by these four nursing homes combined. Um, and those are direct care staff. That doesn't include uh, other types of staff that may be coming in and out. Um, we are in the process of uh, having conference calls with the state health department to determine um, how to best implement and roll out the testing. And we are continuing to receive uh, test kits. Uh, we've received two large shipments of test kits uh, from the National Guard at the Emergency Operations Center. And public health is also focusing on community testing and planning and continuing to have more weekly um, test sites. So we are doing a lot of planning, a lot of scrambling, conference calls to make sure that um, the governor's directive is carried out in the, um, the best possible way. It is a big challenge to uh, have to be able to test uh, nursing home staff twice a week. Uh, so we're waiting for further guidance and uh, information on how we can get support from the state health department. And we are coordinating this with our four nursing homes through the EOC. Okay. The next question, Nancy, is will the Department of Health be issuing guidelines as to when it is safe to open community pools and best practices when doing so? No policy decisions have been made at this time. This guidance is in the process of being developed by the New York State Department of Health. Okay, next question is for Josh. If the schools are closed, how can the opening of camps be considered when they have far more kids than most of the schools in Sullivan County? How will social distancing be monitored and enforced at summer camps? Thank you, Mike. Um, so I, I'm afraid this uh, answer to this question kind of uh, with what we saw today from the governor's press conference. He's um, issued a, a new publication, New York Forward, a guide to how we are going to reopen um, society and businesses in, uh, in the state of New York. So what the governor's done is created regions, um, and Sullivan County is in the mid-Hudson region um, um, for reopening. Um, and then there's a four-phased approach, depending on what type of business you are in, on how and when you'll be able to reopen. So, and then there's seven data points you have to meet um, um, to be able to reopen. So there's four or five regions, more rural regions in upstate New York, that are scheduled to reopen starting this Friday, May 15th. We are unlikely to be one of those regions that we are meeting five of the seven metrics. Um, so there's two metrics that we need to improve on as a region to be able to start that phase one reopening. And then within those phases, there's certain businesses slated um, to reopen um, in, in, in each phase. So the first phase is uh, manufacturing where uh, distribution primarily in curbside, curbside retail pickup is some other minor things. But so I think when you then frame this question in terms of camps, where would a camp, their businesses, where would they fall in one of these four phases, right? So I think that's something that has yet to be determined and defined by the state. Um, if you've seen, um, and we've talked about it for the past couple of weeks, this is at this point not a local determination. Um, the state is making those decisions on businesses and when they can open at the state level. Um, there was a, a, an article in one of our uh, journals uh, t today that uh, a Columbia County had requested locally to ban camps this summer and was rejected by the state. So it's been made crystal clear, at least at this point, that the state is going to be making that determination at some point. But what we're doing, obviously, because it's not our control, we need to prepare that they will open safely. So um, we've had weekly meetings with camp owners. Um, some are eager to open. Some have just made that decision not to open on their own. Um, but we're doing looking at pre-testing, pre-screening, putting campers in smaller groups, um, um, limiting or outright prohibiting uh, field trips outside of the camp. So there's a lot of planning going on to be prepared for the end of June if, if the state decides to open camps. The next question, Josh, 
Is there a plan to protect locals when summer residents return to Sullivan County? There are many older, vulnerable people here. We also have limited resources. There is an expression, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Again, a lot of what we've been talking about um, over the past several weeks is, I mean, people need to uh, adhere to the CDC state local health department guidelines on social distancing, continue to wear face masks in public if you can't remain um, uh, further than six feet from a, a, a non-family member. Um, we're looking at um, how to reopen, as I touched on in the prior question, reopen businesses safely. Um, so the EOC has kind of pivoted a little bit. Um, public health working on a lot of the medical side, the EOC is starting to look at working with our economic development partners on how businesses can plan to reopen once we've met those seven metrics. Um, we're doing something similar at, at the county level, um, uh, having department heads look at what um, uh, infrastructure would need to change within their offices or what equipment they would need to be able to open safely. Um, so there's a lot of planning going on right now, so we won't be ready for um, um, the, the fifth May 15th date, but we're, we're planning so hopefully shortly thereafter that when we do start seeing a lot more people in our county that we can continue to be, practice those good social distancing and have businesses open safely at the same time. Next question, Josh. It's a long one. <clears throat> it is my understanding that the leaders in Sullivan County backed down on their support of Nancy McGraw, the Director of Public Health's advice that the camp's not open for the summer. Since the majority of those living in Sullivan County are vulnerable to the virus, how are those in charge going to advocate to severely limit the influx of visitors who do not personally own homes and pay taxes in the county so that the residents are not at risk? Again, t touching on the uh, on the phase reopening of, of our economy, I mean, I, I kind of like to think of this question not just in terms of camps, but we have a, obviously a lot of visitors come to our county in the summer months. Think of a casino, water park, Bethel Woods. So we need to be planning for a safe reopening to kind of get our, our sanity back and economy back going. Because as you heard, uh, Congressman Delgado and Nancy Buck uh, very detailed oriented in how, how bad uh, municipal budgets are looking at this point. So I think when you're looking at um, making determinations for the summer, we're making, trying to make this d decisions uh, six, seven weeks away when we don't necessarily know exactly what that will look like. Um, we're using available data today, um, uh, and, and the balance is making a decision too quickly to, to not open things up versus making a decision too late in the game and trying to rush something in. So I think what the governor has kind of done it, with this phased in approach makes some sense. Um, I, I think everyone would love to just be able to open up everything immediately tomorrow, but obviously that can't be done in a safe manner. So I think the phased approach with a lot of planning up ahead will prevent unnecessarily outbreaks um, in certain areas in the future. And before we go on to the to the next question, I just want to <clears throat> just want to state that the um, the way that this question is phrased, the um, the legislature in no way is um, minimizing the work of and the thoughts of Nancy McGraw. Quite to the contrary, uh, Nancy is an asset to the county. I think anybody who's watched these town halls realizes that. Nancy gives her opinion, it, and she is our um, she is our go-to uh, person. But certainly, uh, when decisions are made, it, it's it's made by uh, not just one. Um, we uh, we talk about it, and uh, then we come to a uh, consensus and move forward. But in no way are we diminishing at all the work of Nancy McGraw at all. And I just want to, I've said it before uh, at these meetings that Nancy is such an important part uh, to the county and the work she's doing is, is phenomenal. So um, I just wanted to state that. Um, I, I basically um, uh, took quite an exception to that question. I'll, I'll be just honest uh, about it. Uh, next question to Josh. How can those of us who are concerned and have been volunteering towards the improvement of the county's health be of support to you, our representatives? Again, I, don't know, I think our, our ECAC would be your first point of contact um, that, that's kind of coordinating all the volunteer efforts that's going on in the county. So the, if you have interest in volunteering, the phone number is 845-807-0925. And I, one of the big areas they're kind of looking at is ensure health um, along with some of our not-for-profit 
partners is food insecurity, right? I mean, I think in good times, we struggle in this county sometimes with some of our underprivileged that, to get food and healthy food. So I think that's kind of where they're spending a lot of their time focusing on with the food hub and others. Whether they're quarantined or isolated or not, I think just getting food into families and kids especially is, is of the utmost importance to kind of keep, keep our, our children and families healthy going forward. Okay, our last question today um, will go to our congressman. <clears throat> Mr. Delgado, what can be done for anyone stuck in unemployment limbo? Some haven't seen a penny for months. Congressman? Yes, um, I have heard uh, a number of folks all across the district uh, who are going through this issue, um, and it is one that I certainly appreciate the frustration around. Uh, not the federal level, uh, we made significant investments uh, to increase uh, the benefit uh, and extend it in terms of length of time and extend who's eligible, uh, self-employed, part-time. Um, and what this has done, combined with the fact that so many folks are uh, you know, dealing with unemployment, I mean, the numbers 20 million uh, jobs lost in the month of April alone. Um, you know, it's been devastating. Uh, now the New York State apparatus, which is responsible for administering the unemployment um, benefits, I'd imagine uh, is receiving a record number of, of applications um, and has probably to some extent been a bit overwhelmed um, by just the sheer value uh, of incoming. Um, which, you know, um, is uh, something that um, for every one individual, um, you know, isn't what you want to hear, right? Everybody needs to have the ability to access these funds and this benefit as, as fast uh, as possible. Um, but what I've tried to do from my vantage point at the federal level is offer my office's services to at least help facilitate folks on a case-by-case -case basis do whatever we can to follow up uh, and, and track down information or point individuals to, uh, you know, where they can get more information on the status of their benefit, things of that nature. And so to that end, to that end, I would recommend uh, uh, folks to reach out if you're still having issues and you're, you're, you're finding you're getting caught up in delays to my office. Um, you know, and you can do that through the website, delgado.house.gov, and, and we have a, a phone app that you can, uh, you know, sign up on, or you can just call directly uh, my office at 845-443-2930. That's 845-443-2930. Uh, so we're here to help, you know, and, and I, I, I certainly understand the frustration. Um, and I've heard this from a lot of folks across the district who are in this limbo period, uh, and they need the help now. So we want to do whatever we can. You know, we did at the federal level, I think we did a good job of, of expanding the benefits, making them more robust. Um, the other challenge is at the state level, how do we make sure uh, that folks can access these funds uh, as fast as possible? Thank you, Congressman. Okay, that does it for the questions today. I'd like to thank, once again, Congressman Delgado. Please keep fighting for us. Will do. Nancy Buck, our county treasurer, thank you for coming today. And Nancy McGraw, thank you. And Josh Potosik, thank you. Um, the folks at the EOC, thank you. Our healthcare workers, thank you. And all the first responders. Um, said it before, I'll say it again. You've risen to the occasion. And uh, we're so very proud to have uh, you folks um, serving uh, on our behalf. Thank you. And um, with that, I'd like to uh, wish everybody a good afternoon and be safe. And uh, bye for now.